What I'd like to do is uh, give you a quick review of where we were last date because that's one of our main key results. And I guess actually this is not dark enough, is it? Yeah, that's better. Okay, so last time we were focusing on this uh, black scholes partial differential equation and I demonstrated how you can go ahead and, and, and derive it. And I want to again remind you of the key steps involved in this. So that first of all, we're making an assumption on the underlying dynamics of the stock price. And so this is, we're assuming stocks are geometric Brownian motions. So ds over s is mu dt plus sigma dw. Mu and sigma are constants here. And the money market account grows at a constant rate r. So dm over m is equal to r dt. And then we said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a strategy which consists of holding certain units of the stock, holding certain units of the money market account, and shorting some contingent claim which we're trying to value. So we're trying to figure out what is the equation that G must satisfy in order for us to avoid arbitrage in the market. And uh, to do this, we set up this initial portfolio. We make it cost nothing at the start. We then impose, we then look at the dynamics of that value, of that portfolio value, imposing the self-financing constraint. So that means that the value in the portfolio is gained only by changes in the value of the underlying assets and not by the change in the positions over that instant in time. So the positions are effectively thought of as being held constant. Alpha sub t, beta sub t are being held as constant over that short interval in time, and all the changes is the asset prices. So S and M. That's why we have that equation. DV is alpha DS plus beta DM, and then we have the short position in the claim, so there's the minus the DG. Okay, then we made one further assumption is we assume that that claim actually can be written, the price of that claim can be written as a function of time and the value of the stock at that point in time. Not all options can be written that way, but some can. So under this assumption, and further, not only must it be a function of time and the stock, it must also be once differentiable in time and twice differentiable in the second argument. Okay, why did we have to make that a differentiability assumption? We made the differentiability assumption so that we can apply Itzel's lemma on that process G. Once we did that, we realized that there are basically two types of terms in the increment of the value of the portfolio. One is a deterministic, or I should say a previsible part, that's our drift. And the other part is the risk, the coefficients of the DW term. That's the part that we don't actually know. So we don't know what is the we don't know what DW is, although we know it's coefficient. We don't we don't we do know what the drift is because we know it's coefficient. And the key idea, one of the key fundamental ideas, is remove the instantaneous risk. Choose the portfolio such that this instantaneous risk is absent. And that choice forces us to choose the position in the underlying asset to be the partial derivative of the price with respect to asset price. Once we did that, then we find that the increment in the portfolio value has only a drift term. There is no volatility term. The coefficient of the W equals zero, which means the portfolio is instantaneously riskless. That means we know whether that portfolio is going to have a positive return or a negative return or a zero return over that instant in time. Now we impose an O arbitrage argument to say that if that coefficient of the DT term there is anything but zero, there will be an arbitrage. Because we know what its drift is. We've started with nothing. We would have something that either grows to be a positive value or grows to be a negative value. And if it's negative, take the short of everything, in which case we would create an arbitrage. So it has to be zero. This is a necessary condition. We don't know if it's sufficient. And in this course, I'm not going to bother to prove the sufficiency of it. Okay, but it's a necessary condition. And given that we now know that um, the portfolio, the increment in the portfolio value is zero, so that's the statements that are written here, and we started with nothing, the portfolio always has to be worth nothing. This gives us a second criteria to determine the amount of money in the bank account. That gives us our beta coefficient. After plugging that back in, we then end up with the Bloch-Scholes partial differential equation. So it is a number of key steps involved, right, to get here. 
And I really want you to make sure you understand those key steps, okay? And again, what are the ideas? Build a portfolio, start with nothing. Make it self-financing. Instantaneously remove the risk. Invoke a no arbitrage argument about the fact that there is no risk. Conclude that the portfolio must always be zero. Substitute back. Conclude that the price function must satisfy this partial differential equation. And this partial differential equation is our Black-Scholes PDE. Okay? So that's the line of um, reasoning that you have to use. Are there any questions that I can um, clarify about this set of um, this argument? No? Okay. Well, once we have that result, we're then curious about how do you solve that equation? All right. How do we solve Sorry, this equation here? That's what we would like to know how to do. In the last lecture, I simply told you, well, let's guess at the solution. Let's guess based on what we already know from the discrete models when we take their continuous time limits. We guess that the solutions are expectations under some risk-neutral measure of the discounted price. And, uh, and when we made that guess, that's, for example, here, we're looking at a, an, a binary option. It pays one if the asset is large enough and zero otherwise. So we simply guess that it actually satisfies this equation, or sorry, that the price is given by this, this expectation. And then what we would like to do is check whether it actually does satisfy the Black-Scholes PDE. And we started the calculation, and I suggested that you sit at home and work through the rest of the algebra because it's a little bit, it's just annoying algebra. It's nothing tech, it's nothing, um, no financial intuition is in there. It's just algebra. So you were able to convince yourself hopefully on your own that that function does indeed satisfy the Black-Scholes partial differential equation. We looked at another example and again had our guess that this uh, relationship should still hold. And once again, in this case, we explicitly checked it and the PDE does in fact get satisfied. So we were happy that at least in the few examples we checked, solutions of that partial differential equation do have a representation given as a discounted expectation of a payoff. Okay? That's what we were able to convince ourselves of, at least with these few examples. And one of the main things that I'm going to do today is convince you that this is not only true for these specific examples, but it's true generically and it requires using a particular result and more or less deriving the particular result. Okay, so putting that aside for a moment, we then said, let's suppose that we actually have price functions now. We've solved the PDE, we've already done it. And I was uh, addressing what a practitioner would do in the real world of how they would use uh, this dynamic hedging argument to hedge a claim that they have written and, and, and given to someone else, sold to someone else. The intuition that you should take away from you, uh, that you should take away from the analysis, the intuition of the final result, is that locally, what this position in the underlying asset is, is locally it's saying you're going to match the option price function locally by a straight line. And the slope of that straight line is, well, it is the partial derivative, and that is the position that you put in the underlying asset because that's what a straight line in price asset price space represents, and, um, and uh, that's pretty much it, is that this straight line is, is what you're using locally to approximate the price function. And if you do this continuously, at, after epsilon changes in the prices, then you will of course match that price function exactly. But in reality, you cannot do that. So what does a practitioner do? Practitioner will trade at regular time intervals, and we talked about two approaches, um, time-based approaches and the move-based approach. In the time-based approach, what we did is we said, let's consider selling this claim, purchasing delta zero, where delta zero represents my position now, of, that, of the underlying asset. And where do we get that money from? Well, we've sold the claim, we have some money in our hand, we purchase it from the money that we have in our hand, and if we need, we borrow some extra. So we have a money market account as well. We then looked at the evolution of that money market account at each point in time, and this is our key result, is that 
the money market account after one time step is equal to whatever you started with, grown at the risk-free rate, and then subtract the cost of changing your position from your old delta to your new delta. And remember, when you go from your old delta to your new delta, there are two main things that have changed. One, the price has moved, the underlying asset price has moved. Two, there's less time remaining until maturity. Okay. So the option price curve has, so the option price curve is not just one fixed curve because that's when you draw a price function, say for a call, that curve represents the price with the maturity of one year from today. But tomorrow, the maturity is one day less than a year. So that curve would slightly change a little bit. And then where you are on the horizontal axis has moved because the asset price has moved as well. Okay. So those are the two main things that you have to account for when you purchase that new position in the underlying, in the underlying asset. Okay, so this is our, our strategy, and then we just went ahead and looked at some scenario generation for this. And, um, well, I guess I don't, let me, I guess I can pull it back up here. And while it's loading, let me remind you of what the difference between time-based and move-based were. So in the, in the time-based approach, you do this kind of rebalancing, this equation here, you do this rebalancing where you change from your old delta to your new delta at equal intervals, or at least at regular intervals, once a day, once a week, something like this. In the move-based approach, instead what you're doing is you're going to rebalance only when the delta has changed sufficiently, uh, has changed enough. And there's a little bit of an issue with this, uh, with this move-based approach. Imagine the case when we do delta gamma hedging. You remember what delta gamma hedging is? Okay. So gamma, when you do a gamma hedge, you are further approximating the curve locally, not by a straight line, but by a quadratic function. Okay. So when you have a delta gamma hedge, there are two things that you have to account for. There are two th sources of delta, I should say. When you do delta gamma hedge, you have the underlying asset and you have the option. The delta of the underlying asset is one. The delta of the option is, some, of, is something else. And you're using both of those to hedge your option that you've sold. So delta comes from two sources when you have a delta gamma hedge. When you try to rebalance in this way, what you need to do is you need to track the total delta relative to the actual delta. Okay, so the actual delta is the delta of the option you sold, that's delta G. The total delta of your replicating portfolio is the delta due to the asset and the delta due to the other claim that you're using to hedge with. Okay, so there are two sources and you should be tracking basically the difference between the portfolio delta and the delta of your option. So only when that has moved sufficiently enough, then you rebalance. Okay? That's the slight subtlety with the move-based hedge. But the principle is, is easily understood as you make a trade whenever delta changes enough. And that's it. And that's all I want you to take away from this. Okay. So let's see if I can find. Here it is. And yeah. Okay, so here was a uh, simulation, and we had a bunch of different results here. So we were looking at that's our PL for the time based approach. This is a P&L for the move-based approach under this particular gap size. And in this case, they more or less look similar, right? More or less the same thing. That was for the delta hedge. Now, when we went to delta gamma hedging, on the other hand, okay, that's your time-based. And that's your move-based. 
there's a clear advantage to do move-based hedging, although there, it's, not, it's not always positive, but the time-based approach is almost always negative here. Why is that? What was the reason that the time-based approach was always negative, almost always negative? Transaction costs, exactly. In this whole analysis, if the Black Scholes approach was correct, I should have a mean of zero. And as I increase the number of transactions, if I re rebalance more frequently, we saw that this distribution gets thinner and thinner and becomes concentrated around zero when there are no transaction costs. But if it costs you something to make a trade, every time you make a trade, you shift your distribution to the left. And so this is why under the time-based approach, here in this particular uh, example, we saw that there were a lot of hedges going on, and you're getting pushed significantly to the left, and this is causing your P&L to look horrific. Right? You wouldn't want to do that. But for the move-based approach, because, uh, let's see, where is it? Here we go. Oh, actually, this was an extreme move-based approach where I've only made two, two rebalances. One at the start and one at the end. So in this particular case, uh, we find that um, your P&L, yes, it's shifted to the left, but there are a lot of scenarios in which you win quite a bit of money because you've only made two transactions. Now, that is perhaps a very big extreme case for the, um, for the move base. Let's put a delta band of 0.1. So when I had my delta band equal to 1, all I've done is I rebalance, I chose a position at the start, and I did nothing until maturity, and then I liquidated. So that's why it's two rebalances. So this is a case where I've, I do some more rebalancing, and as you can see, we're sort of concentrated around, mm, say maybe the average might be about five trades in that time frame. And here, hopefully we'll see that my P&L looks a lot, um, looks better. Yeah. So this looks better than the other one that we had when we only had two transactions because with two transactions, the, the mode was, was to the very far left. Right? We had a huge spike out here at negative two. Now we can see that that spike has moved in quote, closer towards zero. So having a delta band that's of some reasonable size is important. You sometimes do better than, move ba than time base heads, sometimes you don't. Okay? And you have to tune that according to the dynamics of the underlying asset and your own transaction costs. Okay. Um, are there any questions that I can address with respect to the simulation analysis and simulations? Like I said, on an, on an exam, I'm not going to ask you to derive anything with respect to move-based approach, right, or time-based approach. You can't. You can't simulate on an exam. Um, but I can ask you something about the qualitative features that we've observed here, such as I don't know, what's a qualitative feature that I haven't pointed out? Maybe you can tell me one, and then I can put that on the exam. I don't know. No, I've already said it, sent the exam, so I can't change it. So what's, a quali what's another qualitative feature that you observe here? So I spoke about the mean just now, right? And the mode. What are your other basic statistics? Variance, skewness, kurtosis. What can you say qualitatively about, well, I think there's one that's obviously different than the other in skewness, right? Time base has a huge negative skewness. The move base has a, has a significantly positive skewness. You can see the tail is heavy, much heavier to the right, while over here the tail is much heavier to the left. And kurtosis would be a little bit hard to tell. You've got to actually compute it here. And my bet is that uh, you have more kurtosis in the, in the time-based than the move-based, but I'm not 100% sure. Skewness is one that's just obvious. 
Okay. Um, if there are no questions about what I just went over, I'd like to go on to the new material then. Nope. Okay. Yep. Sorry, the recording? Um, yeah, it is posted now. I posted it last night. I completely forgot <laughs> to compile it and post it. So I did that last night. Okay, so uh, one of the main things that I'd like to do uh, today before our first break is show you how to solve uh, partial, the partial differential equation that um, the block shows partial differential equation that we had. So, in general. So this was our partial differential equation and uh, the solution is going to be using and kind of deriving, at least showing you heuristically why this is true through something called the Feynman-Katz theorem. Okay, so if I were to ask you to write down what you expect the solution to be in complete generality for this equation, what is your, what is your guess for this function? based on what you know before, not based on knowledge about PDEs, but based on what we've seen already. Well, we know, we should be able to guess that the solution of the equation could be written in this way where st equals in distribution s e to the r minus a half sigma squared big T minus little t plus sigma uh, w big T minus w little t. Okay. We should be able to guess that it equals this where, let me put the, a bar on top of these things here to denote that these are not the original Brownian motions that we had before. These are Q Brownian motions. So I'm going to put a question mark over that equal sign. This is what we would like the answer to be. Because if it was this answer, then everything corresponds exactly to what we had in discrete time when we took the limit of the steps going to zero. And so it would be great if we had that result, because this result also has a very nice, simple financial intuition. All you do is you compute the expected random payoff and discount it. The only difference is the measure, the probabilities that you compute the expectation under are not the ones you began with. They're not the P probabilities. It's some other thing, some other Q probability. Right, that's what we would like. Okay, so it turns out this is true. So how do we see, how can I convince you that that function actually does solve that PDE? Seems like a difficult thing to do, right? One is a partial differential equation which has no stochasticity in it, right? It's a PDE. There's nothing stochastic in a PDE. PDE is a purely deterministic thing. It's just about derivatives of functions. While the second equality, while the G written as an expectation, requires the introduction of a stochastic variable. So it's a little bit odd that these are actually connected in some way. So here's the, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna basically go through the derivation uh, showing you that suppose you write G in that way, then uh, what can we do? And in order for us to, to get through the main result, I'm gonna prove to you one key observation Suppose if I define a function h t comma s, I simply define it to be the expectation 
under the risk neutral measure of a function of terminal stock price conditional on ST equals little s. Okay? Suppose I just define that object. This object has a very interesting, uh, in fact, let me not, um, let me, yeah, sure, that's fine. Conditional on that, that's fine. Okay, this object has one very important property. It is what's called a martingale. Remember, we talked about martingales in discrete time, long time ago. The basic idea that a martingale is a free game. It's a process in which when you compute its expected value at any point in the future, it just equals its current value. And we've seen it come up again and again. In fact, relative price of a traded asset to the money market account is a martingale under the risk neutral measure. Right? If you take the ratio, it equals its expected value of its future ratio. So objects of this kind turn out to also be martingales. And let me write out the word for you fully. So I'm going to put in brackets here, what do I mean by martingale? That means if you take the expected value under Q of the process at any future time, given information about the process at an earlier time, this equals the process at the earlier time. Okay? Now, this is not strictly formally correct, but it's more or less what you need. So it's telling you that take the, and here S is bigger than T. And in fact, I want it to be less than or equal to the capital T. So it has exactly this idea that it's a fair game in some sense. If I look at its future value and I compute its expectation given what I know about the process today, that future expected value is just its value today, nothing more. So I need to convince you of that. I'm just telling you this, this is true. So how would you show that? So the idea to show that is to just take the expression um, you know what, because I'm using S for the asset price, maybe S is not such a good idea to be used as a time index here. So I'm going to change it to U, just so that you're not confused with um, asset price. So what I need to convince you is I basically just need to convince you of this equality here. So let's just do that. Let's do the calculation. Let's check. And you'll be surprised at how powerful that one result is. That one result is going to lead to very interesting things. So if you take the expectation, I'm just simply going to write um, I'm just going to compute this expectation of HU given HT. All I'm going to do is I'm going to insert what is HU? What's the definition of H subscript U? Well, that is the expectation of phi of S at capital T given S at capital at little u. All right, that is what HU is. And then we have to be given H little t. That is really HU. All right, just look at its definition. H at any point in time is its expected value of the phi function given the asset price at that point in time. So H at time U is the expected value of the future asset price, function of this future asset price, given the, current, given the asset price at time U. And now you're more or less done. 
This is an iterated expectation, isn't it? You can view this as an iterated expectation. Knowing the future asset price, taking an expectation, and then conditioning only on H right now, and knowing H right now is actually equivalent to knowing S right now, because H is just a simple transformation of S. So I have had to make one assumption here, and this is why I said it's not strictly correct there. I have to assume that that H is invertible in the second argument, but it doesn't really change much. Right. Conditioning on H is the same thing as conditioning on S at time little t. So just the law of iterated expectation, nothing more than that, simply tells me that this is the expectation of phi of S at capital T given S at little t. Right? I just remove the inner expectation. And then, now you just make an observation. Well, the definition of H at time little t is in fact the left hand side here. So this is h little t. That's it. You're done. There's nothing more to do. So the whole idea is that you're taking some object which is random in the future, taking its expected value given the information you have today. And whenever you do that, that process turns out to always have the same mean. That's what this is telling us. The expected value of this future process is always equal to its current value. Okay. Today is always the best estimate of that future expectation. Okay. So you can think, so maybe I'll write that down here. So today's value is the best estimate of the future expectation. That's what this, this statement is saying. Okay, now why the heck is that a useful thing to know? It looks like a completely just pure mathematical or probabilistic result. Well, if you're awake, you realize that this expectation is in fact part of our guess for the price. It's part of our guess. So what we know at this point in time, that part of our guess, the part without the discounting, has this property that it is a martingale. Okay? So how are we going to use that for our, that result? So here's the idea. So we have the expected value so we'll work with just this with this function h for now. We have that the expected value of h at any time u given h at time t is equal to h at time t. So this implies that the expected value of h at time u minus h at time t given h at time t is equal to zero. Okay. I, all I've done is I've put the, the h sub t on the, other, on the right hand side, I've pulled it onto the left hand side, and since the expectation is a conditional one, you're conditioning on knowing h sub t, h sub t is in fact a constant, and I can put it under the expectation. Okay, is that clear? Okay. So let me maybe... Maybe I'll put one more line in between these two, just to be crystal clear. And I'll put a note here, since h sub t is a quote-unquote constant under 
the expectation given HT. Okay? It's only because I've conditioned on HT. If I didn't do that, I wouldn't be able to pull it under the expectation. Okay, anyone have an idea of what, what I might want to do next? If you know that the increment, so uh, by the way, what does it say in words? That last equality. It says the increment of the value of the process in mean is zero. Right? Okay. And it's true no matter what u is, as long as u is bigger than t. So why not well, we remember, what are we trying to do? What's our ultimate goal? Our ultimate goal is to come up with a partial differential equation, right? That's our ultimate goal. What, are P, what, what objects appear in your PDE? Derivatives, correct? What are derivatives? They have something to do with small changes in whatever it is you're taking the derivative of, right? So doesn't it make sense to perhaps think of this increment over a small distance? Take this u to be t plus epsilon so that we look at an incremental change in h. And if we look at an incremental change in h, then we could perhaps say something. We'll, we'll, we will, in fact, be able to say something about its derivatives. So what's under this expectation then is h at t plus epsilon minus h t. That's what we have under the expectation. What theorem that you know of can tell you something about this increment? In fact, it's a lemma. Ito's lemma. Right? Ito's lemma tells you that so let me just um, write Ito's lemma not in the form I'm going to use it here, in the standard form. Okay. Ito's lemma tells me that dh, and I want to write this in a different color because it's not the form. I'm, I'm going to use the integrated form, the actual form. The qualitative version of Ito's lemma is dh is equal to partial. Remember, h is a function of time and s, so there will be a partial of h ds, there's going to be partial in time dt, and then there's the itto correction. Right? This is our itto's lemma in differential form. Now, in order for me to have written this, I actually had to tell you what is the dynamics of S. What SDE does it satisfy? So let's slide back up here for a second. I've simply defined H as this expectation, and we've told you that S at capital T in distribution equals that. Well, we could also since we just have an equality in distribution, but we kind of guess that probably once we changed, once we use Brownian motions, we don't have to put equality in distribution because the Brownian motion tells me about the whole path. Right? So probably this equality is not just in distribution. It's probably for the whole Brownian motion. It's probably for the whole path, sorry. So in order for me to write down what ds is here, so let's just say recall our guess, was that st equaled in distribution s little t e to the r minus a half sigma squared was this. So further guess why not simply write s be equal to e to the minus a half, not in distribution, 
but in fact pathwise. This guy. And we know from our previous work on when we just applied Edo's lemma that the statement the statement above, the last two statements are equivalent to one another. If F, if F, if, sorry, if F solves this stochastic differential equation, it can be written in that exponential form. And if F is written in that exponential form, it actually solves that differential equation. Right, we saw that. We did that example in class um, maybe two or three lectures ago. So this tells me, so why did I do that? Because now I know what I can put here. Right? And as well, strictly, I also needed to know this in order to know what to put there. In Ito's lemma, what should happen is I need to, first of all, put the S on this side of my equation. And what appears in front of the DW term here is always the coefficient of sigma, of the, sorry, the coefficient of the DW term squared. And whatever appears in DS is, well, whatever DS happens to be. Okay, that's just straightforward application of Ito's lemma. Nothing complicated. Okay, the complicated thing here was to go from the guess about the distributional property of S, which we guess from that discrete model, to saying that perhaps when we look at this as a process, we should use the whole Brownian motion and not just the distribution of the Brownian motion. Okay? Remember, those were two distinct things. We clarified their difference last class. If you still have question about it, ask me, because it's an important distinction. OK, so let's get back on track to where we want to go. Remember, what we're doing is we're trying somehow to make this guess about the expectation uh, show that that guess actually solves this PDE. That's what we want to do. So we're looking at this increment, and we're now going to use Ito's lemma, but let's use it in integrated form. Because epsilon is just something positive. We don't really, it's not an infinitesimal thing, and we know that the equation that's written in the round brackets doesn't actually make mathematical sense. Right? We have to be a little bit careful about it. So what does this increment mean? This increment, according to Ito's lemma, in integrated form means integrate from t to t plus epsilon of the partial derivative of s dsu plus the integral from little t to the little t plus epsilon partial derivative of s du, and this will be hu. Oh, I forgot the uh, h over here. And one half sigma squared integral little t to little t plus epsilon partial derivative dwu. Okay. So all I'm doing is I'm using that second line and just putting integrals around them. All right, because what's written in black actually is correct. It actually makes proper sense. All of those objects are defined. What's written in green is not defined. Hmm? Ah, the partial t, thank you, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so now what we do is we're going to use that expectation and apply it to this object. And there's a couple of things that are going to happen. What is the expectation of that third term? When I apply the expectation on that third term, expectation of this is zero. Do you remember one of those key results that we showed when we defined stochastic integrals? I showed you that the expected value of a stochastic integral is zero. Okay? So that's going to be zero. As well, when we insert the expression for ds over here, when we take this expression and insert it in for ds, there's one term, this dw term, 
which gives us a second stochastic integral. And that expected value will also be zero, right? For the same reason. So, so let me just write down This equals zero implies the expected value of the integral t to t plus epsilon, partial derivative of h with respect to s, and the only term, the dsu, what's the only term that isn't zero? It's r times s. du. Okay, that's the only term that isn't zero from there. And then the second term is not zero. And the third term is zero. Okay, conditional on HT. So let me put a note here. This is all because the integral from little t to little t plus epsilon expected value of gu dwu, or not g, let's call it some arbitrary lu dwu is equal to zero. Okay, that's a key result that we're using. Now you'll notice that these two terms are actually of the same kind. They're both Riemann integrals. They're both being integrated with respect to the Lebesgue measure here, du. So we can, in fact, combine them. There's no reason to put these as two separate terms. Let's just combine them. Um, did I... You know what? I've made a, a really stupid mistake, and, and you're all just sort of being lulled by my voice and, and completely forgotten the mistake. The ITO correction term, what should it be? Okay. What is the ITO correction term? It's this, right? But it's not DW, it's DT. That's why when I looked at my result, I was wondering, wait a second, there's something wrong. <laughs> The intercorrection term is dt, not dw. Okay, so we actually have three terms that remain. So in the video, I'll, I'll try to, rec I'll, try to um, I'll correct that by voicing it over if I get time. So there's the one half sigma squared su squared and similarly over here, this should be a du. Okay? So there are two places to correct. This and this. Okay? Those two. That's all. And so then I'm two derivatives with respect to asset price, u, du, is equal to zero. And this integrand is time u. So the, all the time indices should be u indices under this integral. Okay, good. Now, you're, hopefully you're starting to see that PDE kind of coming alive now, right? It, all of a sudden, there are partial derivatives there. There weren't any a moment ago. Just by using the fact that the increment has a zero mean, we now have that the expected value of this integral is equal to zero. 
So now, in order to really prove it rigorously, we have to do some. We have to use. We have to use some boundedness um, relationships. We have to use something called the big dominated convergence, which we're not going to go into. Basic intuition. What do you think I need to do for a basic intuition to reduce this? What I want is somehow I want to get rid of that integral. I want to get rid of that expectation somehow. Right? That's what I'd like to do. So what would the intuition be? Hmm? What's that? Partition? Mm -mm. No. We've got an epsilon there. What do you know about integrals from A to A plus epsilon of some arbitrary function of U, du? If you took 1 over epsilon of that and you took the limit as epsilon went down to 0, what is that? That's just L evaluated at the point A. Imagine this is a Riemann sum. The integral from A to A plus epsilon is really approximated by LA times epsilon for small epsilon. And then you're dividing by epsilon. So it's approximately. It, it will become equal to L at that endpoint. It's almost like the fundamental theorem of calculus. You're taking the derivative of an integral. It's effectively what you're doing. Okay, so this is what we can do. But in order to do it properly, we can easily divide by epsilon. That doesn't, that doesn't pose a problem. What poses a problem is interchanging the limit and the expectation. And that's where you need to use these um, dominated convergence. Okay? But we'll assume that we can interchange the limit and the expectation. So if we can do that, then we would simply have that the expected value of the partial derivative of, let me actually write it in this way, r times s. partial derivative h. So now everything is at time t all of a sudden. All the u's become little t. This is 0. And then the final thing to notice is that, well, everything that I've underlined there is actually just some function of h. It's, it's a property about the function h. And you're conditioning on unknowing it. So in fact, everything that I've underlined is not random relative to that information. So the expectation is, in fact, irrelevant. So, since we're doing this condition on a specific S, we can just change it to being from the process to the state variable again. And this gives me, let's interchange the order. We'll write the partial in time first. This gives me partial time H T comma S plus R S H T comma S plus one half sigma squared S squared two derivatives H T comma S equals zero. Does it look familiar? That equation? This is almost the Black Scholes partial differential equation. The only difference is that the right-hand side here is 0. In the black shoulder, the right-hand side would be r times h. So we've almost got it. Do you see how powerful that martingale result is? All we, do, all we use is the fact that 
if we compute the expected value of this phi function given what you currently know, that thing is a martingale, apply it to those lemma, and out comes that H has to satisfy this PDE. So all we need to do is, the last thing we need to do is show that G, in fact, satisfies the Black-Scholes PDE. So let's just, uh, that just requires two lines of work. G is, in fact, this times H. So in other words, H equals this times G. So simply substitute this expression for H into the box. And what will you find? When the partial derivative of time hits the exponential, you'll pull down a factor of minus r times, in fact, at every term, you'll have this exponential term coming back. So let's, we'll just pull that out front. When the time derivative acts on the exponential, you'll get an extra factor of minus r times g itself. Then you're going to have when the time derivative acts on the function g. And then every other term, this, the, last, the second, this middle term and the last term are, are derivatives with respect to s. And s does not appear in that exponential factor, so those derivatives simply hit the g function. This is zero, and we're done. Put the, we have the exponential, divide it, put the minus r times g on the other side. Last thing to check is, does G satisfy the boundary condition? Does G at capital T actually equal phi of S? So let's just check that. Well, G at capital T actually equals H at capital T, doesn't it? Because the exponential factor is e to the zero, so that's one. And what is H at capital T? Slide back up. H at capital T is this expected value, but if you're at capital T, the phi of S is known. It's not random. So it comes out of the expectation. So H at capital T equals phi of S. And then we're done. That is the Block-Scholes PDE, together with the appropriate boundary condition. Okay, so what we've proven, what we've basically proven is the Feynman Katz result in a slightly hand waving manner, but it's reasonably close. So Feynman Katz, here's the general form of Feynman Katz. This was a specific one. I'm just going to give you the general one, and on your exam, it's your very first page of your exam. It's actually given to you, so you don't have to memorize it. You don't have to remember how to derive it. I won't ask you to derive it. I'm only going to ask you to use it. Okay? After all that hard work, right now you can just forget what we did. But, you know, hopefully you've learned something by uh, seeing how it's derived. So the Feynman Katz theorem basically says. Um, If it satisfies the PDE, partial T G plus any function of time and S, S partial S G plus any other function of time and S squared times S squared 
two derivatives g equals any third function of t and s g and you have this boundary condition then g admits a unique solution given by and here's the result given by g t comma s equals expectation under some probability q of e to the negative the integral from zero to little t of c of u comma su du times phi of s uh, sorry that should be um, integral from little t to big t s capital t given s little t where dst over st equals a t comma st dt plus b t comma st dw q. So this is a q Brownian motion. Okay, it's a bit of a mouthful, <laughs> as you can see, which is why I give it to you. But um, I want to point out a couple of things about, about it, and then you'll realize, actually, it's easy to remember once you, once you realize a couple of things. There's, it's not too bad. Okay, so I'll wait till, you, till I see your hand stop scribbling away. All right. So here are, the, here are the key points. Whatever appears in front of the G on the right, so first of all, this equation, this PDE, is kind of like a Black-Scholes equation, sort of, except instead of R, you have this function A, and instead of sigma, you have this function B, and on the right-hand side, instead of, function, instead of R, you have this function C. So it's just a generic thing. So whatever appears in front of the coefficient on the right-hand side that is what shows up like a discount factor. Whatever appears on the right-hand side is effectively showing up as a discount factor. Whatever shows up in front of the linear derivative term shows up as a drift in this expectation representation. And whatever shows up in front of the second derivative term shows up as the volatility. So those are the three things that you just need to identify. The right-hand side is my discount factor. The coefficient of the linear term is my drift. The coefficient of the second derivative term is my variance. So take its square root and I get the volatility. Okay? That's the key thing to notice. And if you're keen, you can try to prove it. It's not something I will ask on the exam. I'll let you know now, so you don't all have to be worried, oh, geez, do I have to try to prove that result and reproduce it on the exam? No, it's not. But if you, if you really want to understand this, you can basically use the approach that I just showed you and see if you can convince yourself that this result, in fact, is true. Okay? All right, so what I'd like to do uh, after, we'll, we'll take a little bit of a break, and what I'd like to do when we come back from the break is show you a couple of examples of how to use the result. Okay? So let's uh, pause for 10 minutes. All righty, so during the break, I had a number of people coming and asking me, uh, here we go, why... Why am I allowed to make that second equality? Why is this true? Okay. Basically, how do I go from here to there? And the reason, as I, when I said it, I didn't write it down, but I, I said it, is because of the law of iterated expectation. If you take the expected value of the expected value 
of a random variable conditional on another random variable given a third. This is identical to taking the expectation in this manner. Okay? That's all it is. You've probably, more, you've probably seen it in this form before without the last conditioning event. But it's also true when you have a conditional event there and, uh, and the event Y contains Z. Okay? So Y is a set of events and it contains Z. So that's what we have in our situation because knowing the future asset price, what I should really strictly be writing here is something called conditional on the sigma algebra generated by the asset price, which means knowing the path of the asset. And if you know its path, then you know, if you know its path in the future, you know its value now. So it's a condition, it's a contained event. Okay, so all, that's all it is, this law of iterated expectation. All right, so uh, as promised, I want to try to use this result in some way and see if we can uh, do something that, that uh, we haven't solved yet. So let's go to a new slide. And suppose I asked you to solve this equation, partial derivative of g plus a constant x plus one half another constant equals c times g. And g at capital T, the function of x, is equal to one. Let's suppose we've got this. Actually, not equal one. Let's say equals x. Why not? And I want you to solve it. All we do is we just apply Feynman Cat. So the result is going to tell us that g t comma x is going to be equal to the expected value of e to the negative, the integral of c, c is a constant, so I just get that, times a random variable, or the, the process, I should say, given that the process starts at little x. And this process has to satisfy this stochastic differential equation. Now, you notice I don't have dx divided by x there. Why? If we go back to the form of the Feynman cats. Whatever is in front of the partial derivative of g with respect to the state variable shows up in front of the dt term. So when there's an s there, I have to divide by s on the left-hand side. But we don't have that extra factor of s. In our case, the a function would be the constant a divided by x basically. Okay. Or just think of it as whatever appears in front of the partial derivative of the g term, that entire thing is what shows up in front of, um, in front of the s term here. So let me, let me write this also in this form so that you can, and I'll put the circles here, here. So that's the same thing as what I had before. But I'm just identifying to show you that it's not just the function a, but it's the a times s that's showing up in front of the dt term. And it's not just the function b squared s squared, the square root of that that shows up. Sorry, it's not just the function b squared that shows up in the dw term, but it's the b squared s squared that shows up. So in this example, since those things are actually constants, there are no x's and so on, I simply have an equation of this kind for the SCE. Okay, so we've got to compute this expected value, and uh, what's our answer? Well, the solution to this stochastic differential equation, the way that you do it, is you solve the stochastic differential equation, and then you compute expectations of that stochastic differential equation. So S of capital T has to be equal to X at little t plus A times big T minus little t 
plus B times the increment of this Brownian motion. Right? That's clearly a solution of this SDE. It's just a Brownian motion, constant coefficients. And therefore, the G function is the expectation under Q of e to this negative c times little x plus a big T minus little t plus b times the increment of my Brownian motion. And I've already used the conditioning event. X, xt equals little x is already incorporated by the fact that I have replaced xt by little x. So I don't need to condition anymore. So what's, this, what's the answer here? It's just that. Right? The mean of the last term is zero. So this is actually a solution to that partial differential equation. And uh, those of you who want, check to see that this actually is a solution. You can check it. It's not too difficult. Okay, what if the payoff was x squared instead? Suppose we had the same PDE, but instead of, suppose instead we had x squared there, what would you do? What changes? Well, we'd have everything that we had there squared, right? That's the only thing that would change. The payoff is the only thing that changes. And um, let's, let's just do that case. So then this discount factor just comes out front. squared and we get a couple of terms. We get x squared plus a squared plus b squared plus twice that term and then twice getting messy at the end of the screen here. Yeah. I think I got all the terms, right? So we can see that um, we'll get x squared here plus a squared big T minus little t all squared. What will this uh, third term be? What's the expected value of big T, w big T minus w little t all squared? Yeah. The increment, right? It's a Brownian motion. Its variance is equal to its increment. And uh, the only other term that's non-zero is this one. And that's zero because it's the increment of the Brownian motion, the last term. So again, you can check, does this actually satisfy the partial differential equation? And, and hopefully you'll convince yourself if you do the work that you do get the answer. Okay, so you should try it. Uh, one, one more interesting example for the same equation is what if you had e to the minus x squared here? So the payoff the terminal condition is that. Mm. Sorry, I don't want the squared in there. I just want x. The squared is too hard. Okay, so let's see. What's, uh,
So it would be, again, this kind of discount-like factor. And I would simply have e to the minus x capital T, which we know is little x, plus a, plus b increment. And you can pull out, um, whoops, this constant bit. And then you have expectation of this increment. And what's the expectation of this increment? Of the exponential of this? Well, this is normal. The increment in terms of distribution is normal zero variance capital T minus little t. So I should be getting e to the, and the mean is zero. So I should get, get e to the minus, e, sorry, e to the plus one half b squared times its variance. Okay, so that's your result. And again, if you want, go ahead and check and you'll see that this does indeed satisfy the, the equation. The boundary condition is clear, right? As little t equals big T, it just reduces to e to the minus x. Okay, questions about this quick application? Nope. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's do one. One more application. Uh, trying to think of a good one to do. You know what? No, I think that's fine. Any, any equation that I'm going to ask you is going to be either of the Black-Scholes type. It'll reduce something to the Black-Scholes type or this kind of linear type. So I'll let you know ahead of time. You don't have to know anything more than those two, those two types of equations. So it will not need it will not necessitate some arbitrary functions of time and s that show up here. Okay. As long as you know how to do the Black-Scholes type and the constant type, that's it. Okay. And only one of those two will show. I'm not asking you both. Yeah? What's that? What do you mean? You mean just as a general question, if there are hard questions on the test? Of course there are hard, there, there must be, right? Otherwise it wouldn't be a test. <laughs> so there, there are, there's a mix of questions. There's easy questions, not so easy questions, moderately difficult questions, and a difficult question. <laughs> yeah? The example, okay. Which half term? Sorry, which, what, what, you mean you're worried about this factor of a half here? Yeah. Well, if you go to the theorem, the statement of the theorem, even, oh shit, I see. You know what, it's my fault. There, there is a half here. There's a half there. The statement of the theorem should have a half. <laughs> and you see that when we did the derivation, in fact, there is a half there. Right. So somehow I just, when I was writing it down, I completely forgot the half. Uh, my apologies. Let me make sure. Yeah, I think that's it. That's it. Thank you for pointing that out. That's good. Okay, Any, anything else about this? If you look at the last year, I have, I have um, some of the old exams posted, right? And you can take a look and get a sense of the kinds of questions that I have been asking in the past. Now, of course, just like all mutual funds, past performance does not represent future. Um, same thing here, past exams do not necessarily represent your exam, but it'll give you a good idea, right? as opposed to mutual funds. Um, it actually does give you a good idea. So let me see if I can 
hook on here and, and show you an example of the kind of question pertaining to this. Usually the question pertaining to the Feynman Katz result is one of the difficult questions, okay, is, is probably the difficult question on the exam, just so you know ahead of time as well. And I urge you when you are working on the exam to, um, to focus your time first on the easy questions because they're all worth the same amount. Right? They're not, it's not like if you worked on the hard question, you'll get more points. So this is uploaded, and you'll see that the questions are more or less standard. Uh, this here, did I ask you Feynman Katz? No, in this, in this exam, I did not ask you about Feynman Katz, in fact, at all. So. Sorry? Oh, that's term test. There we go. That's, that's why. There's a lot of empty space. Don't get frightened by the page numbers. <laughs> Actually, why don't we kind of run through this a little bit, just to give you an idea. Uh, on this exam, you had nine questions, actually. There are quite a few. I think I, um, yeah. So I almost always do this. I almost always ask you, briefly explain two concepts. And they're different, usually. Then there's uh, please indicate true or false type question. Okay. So, you know, here's an example of a kind of question pertaining to that uh, delta hedging stuff. Okay, and in this case, in this case, I talked about what happens if you hedge with an incorrect volatility. I didn't tell you guys about that this year, so you won't expect that, but you'd expect something else that I did discuss in class. There's always a sketching question about sketching deltas and sketching gammas. Okay. There's always some sort of discrete time model question. For, it depends, sometimes it's interest rate, sometimes it's equity, but it's just a basic discrete time model. And in this case, that's continuing the question. Uh, in this year, I asked them to check that this thing actually satisfies the Black-Scholes PDE, but with zero interest rates. It turns out it's a much easier calculation than the one with general interest rates. And, uh, oh, th so right, the first part was actually just derive, show that the price of this kind of digital call was that. And the part B is to confirm that it actually satisfies the Black-Scholes PDE. And then here, uh, you've got correlated Brownian motions and you're doing an integration by parts formula. You should all be familiar with that. mean invariance of this kind of thing. So this is using Ido's isometry. Now we get into serious questions, right? These are the ones that have become more difficult. And um, here, so this is something we haven't covered yet, is multiple assets. How to deal with that? I'll tell you about that next class, okay? The Ito's lemma for two assets case with correlation. We've studied how to correlate Brownian motions. We've actually introduced that already, but we haven't studied how to model two assets at the same time and then do valuation on that. So that's something I would like to cover. And I think the last, yeah, this was a question that they were told was coming. So I usually do that, right? I think I've already told you one that was coming. If, and I hope you took note. I made it very clear on the time when I, when I posed it. And the last question, this is hard, okay? This is a hard question. So I've given them the Vasicek model and I'm asking them to show something about the distribution of the integral of that model. And I only ever expect just a couple of people to solve um, in a reasonable way the last question, okay? And, uh, but typically, the, the average typically is somewhere around 70, 70 something, 
like 71 around there in terms of your final grade. So I expected the same to be this year. And if we look at last year's exam, it's more or less the same format. In fact, in this year I only had eight questions because I think one of them was longer. So that this year I actually asked the same briefly explained concept. The exact same thing. It is not true for your year. <laughs> okay, I will tell you that now. <laughs> but it is, okay, I'll tell you this. One of these will come, but not both. <laughs> it's not a contradiction, right? I said it's not in this, you will not get both the same this year. <laughs> and there will always be true or false, just like this. There will always be a sketch of a delta, sketch of a gamma, okay? Here's a discrete time model, once again. Do something with the discrete time model. Here's a continuous time model, and this question, again, was very similar to the year before, except there was a uh, modification of the payoff, and confirm satisfies Black-Scholes. Once again, integration by parts formula. Another Ito's isometry-like question. And a multiple asset question. Broken up into two parts. And then the last question is a dynamic hedging argument question. But I'm asking you to do it with two assets as opposed to one, like how we proved in class. You're going to use both assets. And then there's a question about Feynman Katz results. Okay. So your exam is, uh, you know, as you can see, there's somewhat of a similarity between the format of the previous yours exam, and yours has a similarity as well. But the specific question, particularly the specific difficult question, is going to be different. And the uh, moderate questions will have very, very similar form. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to, I was, I wanted to post it at the same time, but I didn't find it, and then I got busy with other things. So I'll try to post it as, I, as soon as I can find it is it's somewhere on this computer and I just don't know where. Okay, uh, let's see, four o'clock, huh? Okay, um, I wanted to do one more sort of piece, slight, one piece of theoretical-like work, but you know, I think you're kind of overloaded with that at this point. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm just gonna tell you a result and then we'll just use it, and, and, and I won't even get into the detail, and then I'll come back to something practical, okay? So one of the, one of the, the this result that I want to tell you about is dynamic hedging in incomplete markets. So I'm not going to go through the analysis. So you remember what the concept of incomplete markets meant in discrete time? It meant that the number of traded assets is less than the number of outcomes. So if I had two traded assets but three outcomes, you cannot exactly replicate a contingent claim. So incomplete markets and interest rates was an example of that. You always have more states than you have fundamental traded assets such as bonds. So when you want to do the dynamic hedging in incomplete markets, the, the way what happens is if you assume, and let's talk about it particularly in the context of interest rates, because that's what is mostly relevant for, um, for you guys in your future careers, actually. So let's take the example of an interest rate model, such as the Vasicek model. The problem with going through the dynamic hedging argument as we had it as we did for the Black Scholes model, is that R is not the price of a traded asset. 
And if you recall, let's just go back here for a second to the block shoals hedging argument. What we did before is we took a position in the traded asset S, a position in the money market, and then short the claim. And that allowed us to be able to instantaneously remove the risk because we could trade S. Now we cannot trade R because R is not the price of a traded asset. So what happens in this case is that you can still do a dynamic hedging argument, but your portfolio is going to consist of alpha units of a different claim, call it H. Okay, cannot trade R, let's say, to price G. Okay, so G is the thing you want to want to want to um, price, and you cannot trade the interest rate to price G. So what you do is you introduce yet another contingent claim, and you trade that together with the money market account. Okay and at the same time, short the claim G. So this is the idea. When you do this, it turns out that the partial differential equation, so I'm not going to bother to, to, to go through the whole dynamic hedging and tell you all the details. Instead, I'm going to tell you that the pricing function for G turns out to satisfy this kind of equation. It has that equation. And this looks very, very similar to uh, the Black-Scholes PDE. The main difference is that this in Black-Scholes was R itself. Okay? It was equal to R. But for interest rate models, it's not. For incomplete markets in general, the drift, the coefficient, and remember that coefficient there tells you about the drift in the expectation representation, that drift is not equal to R. What it's equal to instead is the original drift for the, inter for the, uh, for the um, interest rate modified by something called the market price of risk. And this market price of risk, it's sometimes also known as a sharp ratio. If you're keen on understanding how this works, um, you can actually look up last year's notes. I'll keep it online, and you can see how this derivation works. But that's our end result, is that you have something that looks very similar to Black-Scholes, where you get the volatility squared of the underlying process. You get Instead of R, you have the old drift minus the market price of risk times the volatility. And this then becomes uh, an issue because you might remember when we dealt with interest rate models, there was sort of a degree of freedom. We were able to choose the probabilities and then make the drift of this little Ho and Lee model to match market prices. And I said that we actually have a lot of degree of freedom. We have no no arbitrage does not fix the probabilities for us. Instead, we get to pick them. The analog of that freedom that we had in discrete model is the degree of freedom that we have in choosing the market price of risk. Now, I say we have a degree of freedom, but in terms of actual implementation, you have to choose that market price of risk to make sure that it matches um, real-world data. So although you have a degree of freedom, you're not completely free to make it be anything you want. It's got to be chosen to make it match the way that the world actually works. And so a typical assumption for market prices of risk in interest rates is that this is equal to some linear function of R. So the idea is that if B is zero, the assumption is that the market assumes just a fixed constant market price of risk adjustment to interest rates. 
And if B is non-zero, then that adjustment depends on the level of interest rates. For large interest rates, you get more market, you get, there's more at risk. The market has more risk aversion, if you want to think of it like that. For smaller interest rates, it's less. Now, what does this do in terms of the dynamics? If you put this equation into this, um, what I've underscored in blue here, then that whole coefficient, you can rewrite it as in that same form, a new kappa and a new theta. All right, you can see it, the, the coefficient there uh, in, the, in this parenthesis, the blue parenthesis is just a linear function of r. And all I'm doing is I'm subtracting another linear function of r. So I've got to end up with a linear function of r. And I've just simply written that linear function of r in this form. So what happens when you change from the real world to the risk neutral where you're trying to do pricing? Because um, uh, what happens is that the level that interest rates mean revert to historically do not have to be the level in which they mean revert to when pricing options. Because you have different level theta showing up here. As well, the rate at which the price at which the interest rates converge to that mean reversion level can be higher or lower than the actual rate observed. That's quite different from the volatility, right? You can see the volatility stays the same. Sigma is showing up in the same place. Sigma doesn't change. But the drift does. So this is kind of an interesting fact, is that under, um, when you go from P to Q for interest rate models, you can change from the parameters kappa theta to kappa bar theta bar, and you can go to, um, you can basically modify the level and rate of mean reversion. And it's an important fact that, uh, that you can do this. If you couldn't do that, you would find that your models do not match market prices. If you assumed that lambda was zero and you just looked historically at what interest rates did and then used that for pricing purposes, you would find that you get incorrect answers for bond prices. They do not match the market. So it's very necessary to incorporate this market price of risk, this extra degree of freedom that you have and that you only have in incomplete market settings. So one, uh, the one question that I'll, that I'll address uh, right now, and then we'll, we'll take a sh another short break, is suppose we have this, how can we price options? Or how can we price, first of all, just a bond? I'm actually not even going to touch options on bonds because it's a little too complicated for, for this course. So what would our, how could we apply Feynman cats to this result? What would Feynman cats say? If we're going to solve that equation, then Feynman Katz implies that we could write G as a function of T and my short rate now equal to the expected value under Q of the discount factor. And what must the discount factor be? E to the negative, the integral of whatever appears on the right-hand side. Now, the right-hand side is not a constant because it's our state variable. So we actually have to do the integral of this process times whatever payoff happens to be conditional on our little t equals little equals this. And we're not done yet because Feynman Katz, we still need to specify what is the SDE that R satisfies when we compute this expectation. And what is the answer? What's the SDE? We're supposed to just read off the coefficients, right? The coefficient in front of the partial derivative with respect to R term is our drift. So that's kappa bar, theta bar minus R. The coefficient of the second derivative in R term is our variant, modulo the factor of a half, so that's just sigma. So we've got that. So in fact, R, in terms of the 
in terms of what we need to do for this expectation has exactly the same form as what we started with. Right? We started with a P model, with a real historical model that is a Vasicek type, and we end up with a model that is a Vasicek type, but with different parameters. That's what I was saying before. So the goal then is how do you compute expectations of this kind? And I think I don't really want to spend too much time, but um, let me sketch the idea for you. Suppose I wanted to compute a bond price in continuous time. How would you do that in this model? How do you calculate a bond price? What's the payoff of a bond? Suppose interest rates go up to 100 at the time in which the bond matures. What's my payoff? Notional is $100. Well, at maturity, I just get my notional, don't I? Always. Regardless of what interest rates are. If interest rates are 2%, I still get $100. If interest rates are 20%, I still get $100 at maturity. So this phi function, in fact, is just 1. And so our, our pricing equation is very simple. And it makes intuitive sense. It's just the price of the discounted $1. But the discount factor is stochastic. So in order to compute this expectation, you need to know something about how this distribution, how the integral of R is distributed. And I'll tell you now that this is normal with some mean and some variance. I'm not even going to bother to tell you. If you look at one of your previous exams, you'll see that that was part of the exam question, is actually coming up with that form. So they were given all of this information, and they're given also the solution for R, and you're being asked to compute that distribution. It turns out to be normal. And that, hopefully that makes sense to you, because you might remember in the Vasicek model, R was normally distributed. Do you remember that? In the Vasicek model, it was normally distributed. So if you integrate, the normal, integrate R at a bunch of points in time, it's kind of like summing up a bunch of normals. So it's not too surprising that the answer is normal. So suppose you, in terms of this M and this V, what would the bond price function actually look like? What's the answer? And this is a distribution under the measure Q. What is the answer for this uh, in terms of M and V? Isn't it just exponential negative M plus a half the variance? Is that it? You're computing the expected value of the exponential of a normal random variable. So it's just that. So that's the, these are the steps that you would have to do in order for you to compute bond prices. And then how do you actually find kappa bar and theta bar? What you do in practice is one of the things that you could do, I should say, is you would have yields for bonds in the market that look like that. Your model, you know, from this I can compute a yield. Your model will tell you that the price is this for one set of parameters, and you keep playing with the parameters kappa bar and theta bar until you get the best possible match to your data. And the best possible match could mean minimize the least squared error, for example. Okay. So it's very different than, uh, than for uh, equity. Here you actually have to do a calibration procedure. But you might remember in discrete time we actually did exactly that. Right. If you think back, when we had the discrete time models for interest rates, we had these little thetas that were changing in time. 
and we had that Excel spreadsheet and we were finding them to make the error between the bond yield from the model and the bond yield in the market be equal. Do you recall doing that? It was before your midterm, so it's a while ago. But we basically did that exact same procedure. So that, but this is the counterpart in the continuous time study as you approach it like this. Okay, and there are some ways to do this in an analytical closed form approach, um, but I'm not going to get into the details. I just want to sketch the ideas for you. Okay, so why don't we take a quick break, say five minutes, and we'll come back, and I'm going to do one very practical thing, is tell you a little bit about um, some insurance, um, embedded options that appear in insurance products, okay, since you are actuaries after all. Okay, so the last thing I want to do today is a very, very simple, uh, down-to-earth example of an actual option that shows up in, in an in insurance type product. And these are called guaranteed minimum with um, death benefits. Actually, no, we'll do withdrawal benefits. And I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail. I simply want to give you an idea of what they are. So the idea of these kinds of insurance products is an investor, so just the big picture, okay? An investor such as, you know, yourselves, uh, typically it's um, someone who's almost in retirement, uh, is going to give an insurance company a big chunk of money, say $50,000, $100,000, one million dollars, whatever it is, some chunk of money, and what the insurance company does is they give you a product that looks like this. They say, here's time, here's the initial investment that you've given them. Let's, for concrete purposes, let's say one million, okay? You give them a million dollars, you tell them, I want you to invest this in a very particular combination of stock and bonds, and what they will actually, what they will normally do is they'll say, here's a, here's a collection of typical portfolios. Here's a balanced portfolio. It has 50% stock, 50% bond. Here's an aggressive portfolio. It's got 80% stock, 20% bond. Here's a, a very conservative portfolio. It's got 20% stock, 80% bond. Okay? One of these, and these will be sort of standard things, and they'll say, you invest in one of those. So you have a fund. You put your cash into that fund, and that fund is going to grow at some rate, whatever the market return happens to be. And what this product does is it says it could be on an annual basis, could be on a quarterly, quarter annual, could be on a monthly basis. You are allowed to withdraw a certain amount of the money. Let's say it's $10,000, okay? And let's say that happens every quarter, just for the sake of illustration here. So. This is that date. You get to withdraw. I've drawn it much larger uh, than 10% there, but you withdraw however much it is. It's $10,000, let's say. And then this gro keeps growing at whatever rate. But, so that sounds like, okay, that's a very simple thing. Doesn't sound like anything terribly, terribly interesting. So why would an investor want something like this? The reason is that if the fund is kind of just doing okay because market conditions are just sort of okay. As you withdraw, you can see what's happening here, right? As you keep withdrawing, there's going to be a point in time in which when you withdraw, there's not enough money in the fund. You see that? There's some point in time in which there's not enough money in the fund. So what does the insurance company do? The insurance company says, okay, I am still going to allow you to withdraw the original amount that you were, um, that you were told you could withdraw. So each of these are 10,000. And they're going to simply say, okay, still at those regular frequent dates,
you withdraw 10000 They're going to pay it to you. So the fund drops to nothing. And these cash flows, these are all the obligations of the insurance company. So in other words, what it's doing is it's protecting you for downward trends in the markets, basically. So if the market does well, so this is one particular scenario that could happen, and this has some finite maturity. It might be you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, say eight quarters. You did this over two years. And this is a really extreme example, okay? But suppose after eight quarters, then the contract ends. Um, but it, it, could, it could so happen that in, in another scenario of the market, or another scenario, whenever you withdraw, I'm, drawing this, I'm going to draw this on a slightly different scale, but the idea is the same. The market is just constantly growing, and it's outpacing, or at least on average, maintaining your portfolio level. Okay, so you actually never go bust. The fund never goes bust. And in this scenario, the insurer never pays you anything. Because it's all coming from the fund. The fund is automatically replenishing itself. So this guarantee, minimum withdrawal benefit, is precisely this benefit. This is, this is the true optionality in there. If we get the scenario like in this case, then the insurer never didn't have to really do anything. They simply had to take the money, put it in the fund, invest it, done. They never owed any cash flows. In scenario number one, they owed a sequence of one, two, three, four cash flows. Four full cash flows and one partial cash flow. This partial cash flow here, because part of it was in the fund, and part of it was not. So this kind of option, there's, a, there's actually an optionality in here, isn't there? You can view this as an option that the insurer has written to you, and that option protects you from this fund going below zero. And you might imagine how you could value this kind of option. Let's ask the question, let's say, let's look at and see if we can formulate what that option actually looks like because this is all in words, how it's working, right? More or less all in words. So let's try to formulate it by looking at one little period and seeing if you can come up with a nice little per period formula. So from here to there, you know that at time period N, if we assume geometric Brownian motion for the fund, right, that would be our, our obvious simple standard assumption that we could use. It's wrong, partly because the fund is a balanced fund, so it's going to have some equity and some bond, and you're not dynamically trading it, you just got a fixed position. So it's actually not GBM, it's a shifted GBM, but that's a small subtlety. So this equals this guy, under the risk neutral measure, which is where you might be doing your pricing purposes, it would be R minus a half sigma squared times the time between these guys plus sigma times the increment of the Brownian motion. Right? That's basically what we've been dealing with for quite a while now. So this is the fund value at the end of that period. So really this is at Tn, T sub n minus before you made your withdrawal. Right? That's actually what you made, that's what you had just before withdrawal. So you withdraw, you get this minus the new fund amount is equal to this minus whatever that $10,000 is. Let's call that K. 
Agreed? So the new fund amount is equal to this, but you get protected. This is maxed out at zero. So if this drops below zero, um, if f is too small, the extra portion is coming from somewhere else. This is what the fund is trying to do for you. So the optionality is effectively looking kind of like a call from one side of the party. On the other side, it actually looks like a put. And insurance companies, the difficulty that they have with this kind of option is when this drops below zero is at a random point in time. So although this can be written in terms of a strip of put options, it's actually a put option on a process which itself is sort of recursively being dropped in this manner. And it gets linked to something like an Asian option. You know, remember this idea of Asian options? I think we talked about it way back. Right? An Asian option is kind of the average of an, of an asset price over a future past, of a, over a past set of time. This you can rewrite in something like an Asian option. And like I said, I'm only giving you these, I'm just shooting this out there so you kind of have an idea of some of the products that, are, that insurance companies are dealing with and um, to show you a little bit of a tie-in with what we've done. I'm not trying to spell out every detail here. And, and if you want more information, let me know and I'll point you in the direction. Okay, one, so, this is, so that's basically their challenge, is trying to model this thing, model this uh, default. This is kind of like a default time. It's the default of the fund. The fund drops too low. And uh, that's a challenge. And then even this model of geometric Brownian motion is not valid. You can see that the returns, particularly over future dates, are going to be uh, dependent on the volatility that prevails in that future. And there's no reason to believe that those future volatilities are the same as our past volatilities. In fact, in recent years, you noticed uh, that there's much higher volatility in the market than there were in previous years. Have you noticed that? I hope you've all taken some interest in the financial markets. Uh, you've seen that volatility is very high. Um, it's come back down again, but there were spikes in the volatility. This type of model, geometric Brownian motion, does not capture those features at all. What you need to do is you need to have a model in which volatility itself is a stochastic variable. And not just a stochastic variable, but a stochastic process. And that process changes with time. So to give you a little foresight into some of the things that you can do when you go on and do your master's and your PhD in, in, in mathematical finance and in some insurance places as well. Um, one kind of model for asset prices is called the Heston model. And here, what you do is you change V, you change the, the sigma, and you make it a process. And this process has mean reverting features. Remember that quality that I said that there's a spike in volatility, but it comes back down? So it's kind of like a mean reverting process similar to Vasicek model, but the difference is you're not allowed to let volatility become negative. Right? Variance in particular cannot ever become negative. And to prevent that, what's often done is you put a factor of square root of that variance in front of this dB term. And this will prevent it from becoming negative. Uh, this particular model, it's a very well-known model and it's um, used a lot. There are a lot of flaws in it for, one, for some reasons or another, but it's still popular in practice. It's called Heston's model, Heston model. And uh, like I said, this uh, volatility process is basically a mean reverting process. And just like the CI, just like the, um, sorry, the Vasicek model, it gets pulled to this level theta. There are spikes, and then it comes back down. Sometimes there are spikes down, it comes back up. 
and it's going to fluctuate around here. So the Heston volatility, this is giving us a stochastic volatility model. And this is important in products, this can be important in products like this one. Why? Because the time frames that are relevant here can be decades, not just a couple of months or a year, but decades. So allowing for volatility to move around, it's an important part of the pricing of these instruments. If you don't incorporate them, then you're going to misprice them severely. And in fact, many insurance companies have been hit not just by misprices because they didn't incorporate stochastic volatilities, but because they didn't appropriately hedge their instruments. They were holding static positions. They sold these kinds of guarantees, but they did not at the same time dynamically replicate the obligation as you've learned that what you've had to do, right, through this dynamic hedging strategy you've seen, that you do need to do this if you want to, your risk exposure to be small. If you purely want to be exposed to the potential of anything, then you don't hedge, but you're going to potentially be hit by a lot of losses. And that's what's happened to some insurance companies. And a number of them are starting up what are called variable annuity hedging groups, which are trying to model and incorporate more sophisticated financial models and the risk management of those models within their groups. Um, let me see. I'll tell you another, another way to incorporate uh, volatility, stochastic volatility, are something called regime switching models. And so regime switching models are models that are based on Markov chains. So the idea here is that you have a number of states. The volatility or the variance is just simply a function of some sort of Markov chain. So H is a Markov chain. And um, it's a Markov chain and it takes on, you know, it has a number of states. So these could represent low vol, high vol. If you think of just two situations, there's only two states in one state of the world, or three states. Typical volatility, high volatility, low volatility. So you can have a Markov chain that switches between these three states and that Markov chain evolves in continuous time, but it only takes on these three values and those three values determine the volatility in the market. You can modify the block show, this dynamic hedging argument that we've developed and so on to come up with partial differential equations which models based on Markov chains also satisfy. And this will help you again in the pricing and risk management of these kinds of products. So they're, they're sort of very important features. Um, let me give you one more example of another kind of guarantee that ensures sometimes right. And uh, this one is called an equity indexed annuity. Okay, so in, in an equity indexed annuity, what the firm will do is they'll say, okay, you give them some investment, they're going to have a lower bound of, that grows, say, at a fixed rate of, um, in fact, let me, since this is usually over a month, it doesn't look that high. There's a lower bound, and the company will say, if you drop below that lower bound return in that month, they will match it. And if, but if you go above some upper bound, your return will get pulled down to it. So what happens, let's take a, let, that's one period. Let's go to another period. So you continue your guarantee from the same previous level because it was never enforced. Okay, so this is your previous level. Here, in this particular scenario, you notice that the fund underperforms. It underperformed the guarantee. So what the firm will do is they will bump up and they will add money to your fund so that it hits this lower bound. And then, let's suppose it, it just goes on again. So from this point, oh, my, my bad. 
Sorry. Okay. You're always getting the guarantee from where, where your fund is at the end of that time frame. And if you underperformed, you get bumped up to the lower boundary. And if you overperformed, you get bumped down. It's kind of odd, right? But the idea is that that helps to curb the cost. If they allowed you to just get all the upside and none of the downside, because this is effectively protecting you from downside, if it allowed you to get all of the upside and none of the downside, it'll cost too much and people won't want to buy it. So they put an upper bound on how much you can gain. And let's uh, draw one more scenario here. So this is going to, this got bumped up to there. And that's my lower bound. That's my upper bound. So again, in the second scenario, I would have been bumped up to that point. And <laughs> it's always a challenge drawing these things. So in this scenario, it overperformed in that time. So what they would do is push you down and your fund would be worth this amount. So this is one form of an equity indexed annuity. It's given you lower and upper bound protection. And what's interesting is that it protects you over each period. It's not just your overall return. And it's not just your overall um, lower bound return and overall upper bound return, but it's the return over each sub period. So in every month, you're guaranteed at least 3% and at most 12%, for example. That's completely different than saying over one year, I'll guarantee you 3% and at most 12%. It's a very different beast. Okay, uh, where's that sheet of paper? Is it, it's done? Yeah? Uh, what's the number written on it? Last number. 